Today we're starting a new unit. This unit is also chapter 11, but it comes from the Algebra 2 textbook. Data Analysis and Statistics. The unit goal that we'll be looking at this unit is I can answer questions by using statistics and normal distributions. Today's lesson is lesson 11-2 and it's on statistical studies and sampling methods. The essential question that we'll be answering is how can you choose the best type of study to answer a given statistical question and choose a reasonable sample? When we talk about types of studies as well as sampling methods and types of questions, we're also gonna focus on making sure that your questions and your studies are done in such a way that they do not create any bias. So let's get started. Before we jump into the different types of studies, I want to just get us thinking here a little bit. So we have two students, Jaquinta and Felix, were asked to design a study to answer the question, what proportion of students at this school listen to music while studying? And the data that both Jaquinta and Felix collected is below. What I want you to do is look carefully at that data and then go ahead and see if you can pause the video and try to answer the three questions A, B, and C on your own. When you hit play again, I'll have the answers written and we'll talk it through. Ready? Go ahead, pause the video. Jaquinta selected seven students in her gym class to ask if they listened to music while studying, and Felix selected students in the library. He observed 100 total students in the library, and he tallied that 43 of those students listened to music while they were studying. How did Jaquinta choose which members of her group to question? Well, Jaquinta asked only her friends, seven of her friends in the gym class, whereas Felix questioned 100 students in the library. Who designed a better study, Jaquinta or Felix? Felix's study is much better for several different reasons. First, he observed a group of students that come from several different classes. Remember that Jaquinta's group was only students in her gym class. So those students are all probably in the same grade as Jaquinta. People in the library come from a variety of different grades and subject areas. Felix also asks everyone and not just his friends. And he's much more thorough because he observes 100 total students, whereas Jaquinta's study of only seven students is too small. The more we can observe for a study, the better. Bigger samples usually get us much better results than small samples do. Now let's talk about the three different types of studies. The first type of study is called a sample survey. And a sample survey asks someone the same set of questions and records the answer. The key to make something a sample survey is that you're asking a question and you're asking that question to everyone. As an example, suppose a newspaper polls random residents and asks who they will vote for mayor. That is a sample survey because we're asking each resident who they're gonna vote for for mayor. The key, again, to a sample survey is that it must ask a question. So I want you to add that to your notes, maybe circle or highlight it. The key to a sample survey is that it asks a question. The second type of study is called an experiment. In an experiment, we're applying treatment to a group and measuring the effects of the treatment. An example of an experiment would be a doctor conducting a trial of a new medication by prescribing it to half of the patients in the trial and measuring the effects of the medication. Whenever we do an experiment, the participants in the trial will always be divided into two groups, a control group and an experimental group. The control group, we're going to keep the same, and the experimental group is going to receive the treatment. That way, we can compare the results of those in the experimental group that are receiving the treatment to those in the control group that aren't receiving the treatment. In medical trials, like trials for new medication, participants do not actually know whether they're in the control group or the experimental group. What happens is everybody gets the medication, but some people have the actual medication, and some people just have what's called um, a placebo, which is really just fake medication. It's medication. It looks like medication, but it doesn't actually do anything. 
So the reason why we do this is that way nobody really knows whether they're receiving the treatment or not. And a lot of new medication can be just like psychological. So you might feel better just because you think you're getting medication that makes you better. Now, those in the control group might show a little bit of improvement just because of that placebo effect, that psychological um, sense that, hey, I received this drug, now I feel better. Whereas those in the experimental group, they're going to get that, you know, that, that effect as well psychologically, hey, I'm feeling better, but then they're also going to receive the drug and they should actually do better than the control group. So that's how medical trials work. Just a interesting FYI for you. And lastly, our final type of study is called an observational study. And this type of study is kind of the least invasive because we don't actually have to ask anybody a question. You just measure or observe members in a way so they don't know they are being observed. I want you to add to your notes that you're not asking a question, you're just observing. So this type of study would be something that we can do by just watching without actually asking anything. An example would be an employee at a grocery store who counts the number of customers that bring reusable bags. This could easily be done, again, without asking the customer a question. You can just observe, do they have a reusable bag when they're checking out or when they're entering the store? We don't actually have to ask them anything. We can record the data without polling or asking any sort of question. Now that we know our three different types of studies, let's try to decide what type of study could you use to answer the following questions. The first question would be, does urban pollution have an effect on rates of asthma? Now with this type of study, you'd probably be best by doing an observational study. For the observational study, we could observe residents in urban, remember urban just means like in the city, and non-urban, areas and then compare the rates of asthma. You probably wouldn't want to do an experiment because nobody wants to um, purposely, like if you have asthma, purposely, um, you know, expose yourself to pollution in the city just to see the results. It'd be much easier to just gather data from a city and a non-city environment and compare the rates of asthma. The second type of question we have here is how many students in a school would like the cafeteria to serve breakfast? This type of question could easily be answered by using a sample survey. It would be easy to do a sample survey because we can just randomly choose a group of students and ask them a question like, would you prefer the school cafeteria serves breakfast? And then we could record their answer yes or no and then analyze the results. Okay, let's look at the third question here. A group of plants is not growing well compared to the rest. What should you change to improve their growth? This type um, would best be analyzed using an experiment. For the experiment, we can split the plants into random groups and give each group a different condition, like more light, more water, more fertilizer. We do want to make sure that we leave one group the same, though, so we have something to compare it to. Remember, with an experiment, you always need a control group. Okay, the final question here, I want you to try this one on your own. Do residents in Invergrove Heights prefer the grove to be open earlier in the morning? Remember, we have three types of studies listed above. I want you to pick which type of study would help you answer that question. Pause the video. A sample survey would be the easiest type of study to conduct to decide if Invergrove Heights residents prefer the Grove to open earlier in the morning. One way you could do this would maybe be to mail a survey to Invergrove Heights residents and ask them, do you prefer the Grove to open earlier in the morning? Now let's talk about bias. When we conduct a survey or a study, it's important that we gather results that are not biased. Bias is defined as if a study systematically produces results that misrepresent a population. When it comes to bias, you have to pay attention to who you're asking the question to, as well as how you're asking the question. So let's look at the following situations. Are the differences between groups potentially due to bias? A psychologist is conducting surveys to study the happiness levels of people who live in a neighborhood. She asked the same questions to two samples below 
chosen from the population of the neighborhood. In the first sample, she asked 100 people surveyed on a sunny Saturday afternoon, and 65% of the people said they were happy. In that same neighborhood, 100 people are surveyed Monday morning, and only 35% are happy. Is there bias between these two groups? The circumstances when the two samples were surveyed may influence their responses. It makes sense that people are going to say they're happy more so on a sunny Saturday afternoon in the middle of the weekend versus on a Monday morning when they're rushing to get back to work. Plus, most people do not like Monday. So these two groups, there might be bias between the results just because of the situations in which they were asked. One on a sunny Saturday afternoon versus one on a busy Monday morning. Here's another example. Let's suppose that a soft drink company calls 500 people at random and asks, is our product or our rival's product the best soft drink on the market? Why might this question be a potential source of bias? This question has more to do with how it's worded versus how it's asked. Calling 500 random people is fine, but some of the words within the question, is our product or our rival's product the best soft drink on the market? This might produce um, results that misrepresent the population. One of those words is our. The company that's calling is asking, which product is better? our product or the rival's product. People might just answer in a way to be polite and say that, oh, your product is better than the rival's product, just to be kind to the person take giving the survey. So when a question is asked, if this were the question, it would be best to be asked by a neutral source, like a survey company, not one of the companies that you're asking about, but rather a more neutral population. So for your answer in your notes, you can write down something like that, but I want you to make sure that you know that the way that the question is asked might lead people to give the answer that the company wants. The question above is an example of a leading question. Make sure that you get the definition of a leading question written down in your notes. A leading question is a question that is asked in a way that persuades you to answer one way. Leading questions are a source of bias. So we have to pay attention not just to where the question is asked, like in our previous example with the Saturday afternoon versus Monday morning, but also how the question is asked. This is how things are worded and make sure that our questions are not leading questions. Leading questions are going to produce bias because the questions are worded in a way that persuades the people to answer one way. Next, let's talk about how you gather a sample. There are various different ways to gather a sample, but we want to make sure that our samples are always random samples. A simple random sample is a sample in which each member of the entire population is equally likely to be chosen. That means each possible sample of the size that you want is equally likely to be chosen. So if we wanted a sample of 100, each group of 100 people would be equally likely to be chosen. That is what creates a random sample. There are a variety of different ways that you can gather a sample, and we're going to highlight the five main types of sampling methods. The first three have a low risk of bias, and the last two have a high risk of bias. Go ahead and find a highlighter, and we're going to highlight the three types and the key characteristics of each type. The first type of sampling method is called stratified sampling. And stratified sampling is when a population is divided into groups with similar characteristics, and a sample is randomly chosen from each group. So maybe we divide people into 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, and then we randomly choose a number from each of the grades. That would be stratified sampling. For the picture below, you can see the two groups, and then go ahead and highlight 
people from each of the groups. So you can see that I've chosen in this model three people from group one and three people from group two. If we were actually doing this, there would be a larger group just for the picture. We'll keep it small as just three. The next type of sampling method is called cluster sampling. And cluster sampling is when a population is divided into convenient clusters. Clusters are again just groups and entire clusters are chosen at random as the sample. So we might divide the school into three different groups and then choose two out of the three groups to ask that question to. So instead of picking some people from each group, entire clusters are chosen at random, so it's still random, as the sample. So maybe we ask everyone in group one and everyone in group two. The third type of sampling method that has a low risk of bias is called systematic sampling. And systematic sampling is when you start with one member chosen at random, then you use a rule such as every third member of the population. So the key here is we're using a rule. Maybe it's every third person. Maybe it's every tenth person. So in this picture here, if I'm going to pick every third person, would go one, then count three. Okay, here, 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 and here. And that's our sample that we gather. The remaining two types of sampling methods, these should be avoided if possible um, because of that high risk of bias. The first is called convenience sampling, and that is only choosing subjects that are in close proximity or easy to get to. So you're picking people that are easy to get to. So I have a bunch of people and I'm just going to pick this group or this person because they're easy to ask. And the final type that has a very high risk of bias is called self-selected sampling. And just like the name implies, you are picking up volunteers. So they get to choose whether or not they respond to the, to the question or to the survey. So we have a group of people and maybe five of those people choose that they want to complete the survey. So convenience sampling, picking subjects that are close to us or easy to get to, that sampling method as well as self-selected or picking volunteers, those two sampling methods should be avoided if possible because there's a very high risk of bias. The first three that we talked about you still have to be careful to avoid bias. Make sure that you don't have any leading questions that might persuade people to answer one way, but there's a much lower risk of bias if you choose the stratified sampling, cluster sampling, or systematic sampling. So here's an example, and we are going to decide which sampling method is used in the following examples. Refer back to your notes with the five sampling methods that we just highlighted to decide first, what is the type of sampling method and is the method likely to be biased? So first, let's say starting with a randomly chosen ID number, every fifth student ID number was chosen and that student was asked to fill out a survey. So the keyword here is every fifth student. That is a systematic way to gather your data because you're following that rule of every fifth student. So for the first part, it would be called a systematic sampling. And is that type of sampling likely to be bias? Not a lot of bias risk there. Generally, that method is pretty good. For our second example, let's suppose a retailer puts feedback cards at the front of its store and they got responses from 22% of their customers. So here, with the feedback cards at the front of its store, customers get to choose whether or not they fill out those feedback cards. So that's gonna be self-selected sampling. And with self-selected sampling, that is always going to have a high risk of bias. So the results of that survey might not be, might not be good. So there's likely to be 
bias. Finally, suppose a city wants to get what percent of people in the city own a dog or a cat, and a city worker goes door to door in the neighborhood around the city hall to ask the people about its pets. Now here, the key here is they are going door to door in the neighborhood around the city hall. Now around the city hall is just a specific neighborhood. So they're not really getting a sample of everyone in the city. They're just picking one neighborhood that's near the city hall. This is a convenient sampling because they're conveniently choosing just one neighborhood by the city hall. And anytime we do a convenient sample, the results are likely to be biased. So these types of questions, make sure that you are reading them carefully and that you are referring back to the five types of sampling that we just highlighted as you're deciding first what type of sampling method was used and then whether or not it is likely to be biased. So let's end with a quick write to describe a design for a controlled experiment to test if drinking coffee improves memory. Remember that whenever we do a controlled experiment, we always have two groups, a control group and an experimental group. Go ahead and write down what would the control group do and what would the experimental group do? Ready, pause the video. Remember that our control group is the group that stays the same. So this group would not drink any coffee. The experimental group would be the group that gets to drink the coffee. Finally now, if we're gonna design this experiment, how does randomization apply to your design? There's a lot of different ways that we could design this experiment. Um, I'm just gonna give you kind of one possible way so first, for randomization, you have to make sure that you randomly choose who gets the coffee and who does not get the coffee. So the groups have to be randomly, randomly assigned. They do not get to pick, hey, I want to drink coffee. I don't want to drink coffee. We also have to make sure that you give everyone the memory test, and then you can compare the results between the group that drank the coffee and the group that did not drink the coffee. So I hope that this video helped you understand the different types of studies as well as the different types of sampling methods and also helps you see that we have to be careful with the type of study that we do, how we ask the question, and how we gather the sample all in ways that avoid bias. So thanks for watching. Bye.